So here's the next version of the intention, the intentional view. We might call it the intentional view mark two. So it says that you not naturally mean that p by doing x, just in case, well, condition one is the same. You intend your audience to believe p because you did x. But we add a second condition, which is that you intended your audience to recognize your intention in one. That is, you intended your audience to recognize the fact that you intended your audience to believe P because you did X. How does that help? Well, let's go back to our detective case. Remember the detective case, I leave the handkerchief by the scene of the crime to get the detective to believe that you are the criminal because it has your, the, the, the handkerchief is monogrammed with your initials. Now in that case, it's pretty clear I don't want the detective to know that I intend him to believe that. I delivered, you know, I'm doing, I'm secretly placing the handkerchief there to mislead the detective into believing that you're the criminal. If the detective knew that I wanted them to believe that you were the criminal by doing this, well, then that would defeat the purposes of what I was doing in the first place. They wouldn't believe, uh, they wouldn't come to believe that you were the criminal on the basis of find the, finding the handkerchief at the scene of the crime. So adding this extra condition does seem to help with the, with the crime scene case. And because we've just added on an extra condition, we have all the benefits of the view we just considered a moment ago. We have all the benefits of the simple view. We're still able to say that putting on a tailcoat doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to a formal dinner. We get, still get to say that saying that Alice is a basketball player doesn't necessarily mean, or I'm not necessarily saying that she's tall, because that was already covered with condition one, so by adding something else on, we get to keep all the, old, the benefits of the old view. However, Grice thinks that this is actually still not quite enough. And the reason why he thinks that it's not quite enough is that he thinks there's a difference between what he, how he, here's how he puts it. Deliberately and openly letting somebody know that something is the case and telling them that the, something is the case. He thinks that these are not quite the same thing. He gives a bunch of examples in the textbook. Here's one of the examples he gives. So imagine I have a child who's been playing in the house and has knocked over a precious vase. So I take the broken vase and I leave it on the kitchen table. And the purpose of my doing so is so that when my wife comes in, she'll see the broken vase and so she'll conclude uh, that the child has broken the vase. Moreover, I do it, so, you know, by leaving it on the kitchen table, it's gonna be pretty obvious that I intend for my wife to, to come to come to believe this. She'll know that somebody put it there. In particular, she, in this context, she'll know that it was me that put it on the kitchen table. So in this case, all of the requirements to mean something are satisfied. I intend my audience, my wife, to believe that the, that the child broke the vase by putting the vase on the, on the table. And moreover, I intend them to recognize my intention. That's why I put it in such a perspicuous place. I wanted, them, I wanted my wife to realize that I intended that. But Grice says that in this case, I don't not naturally mean that the child broke the vase by leaving it on the table. This intuition is kind of a little bit subtle, and I actually even myself have a little bit of trouble getting this intuition. But here I think is the way that Grice wants to push it. How would you describe me putting the vase on the table? Would you say that by doing that, I am telling my wife that the vase is broken? And I think he wants to say, no, I'm not telling my wife that the vase is broken by doing that. And one reason why I'm not doing that is because my wife would come to the conclusion that the vase was broken by the child, independently of whether she recognized this intention or not. Seeing the broken vase would make her believe the vase is broken, regardless of whether she recognized my intentions. So my intention for her to recognize the intention in one, my intention for her to recognize that I intend her to believe that the vase is broken, actually has nothing to do with why she forms the belief in the first place. It's just seeing the vase by itself is enough to give her the belief. And for this, and for this reason, Grice wants to say, this is not an example of me telling my wife something. Because the means by, by which she comes to have this belief, seeing the vase broken, that would cause in her the belief that the child broke the vase, regardless of whether I had this further intention in two. So that's why he thinks that that's a counterexample. As I said, I think this, the, the example is kind of subtle. I sort of see what he's getting at, but this example does not seem to me at least as clear as any of the other examples we've seen so far. But let, for the moment, anyway, we'll give Grice the example. 
if this is an, if this is an example where I intend my wife to believe that the vase is broken by leaving it on the table, and I intend for her to recognize that intention, even though it's not a case of non-natural meaning, what, ex what extra do we need to add to the theory? And Grice thinks the answer is, well, we actually need to add yet another level of intention to the theory. And once we do that, then we end up with the picture that Grice actually himself does like. So now we arrive at what Grice actually thinks the right account of non-natural meaning is. As I said, the account is pretty similar to the ones before, we just add on an extra condition. So we say, you not naturally mean that P by doing X, just in case three conditions hold. The first two are the same as before, so you have to intend for your audience to believe P because you did X. And you intend for them to recognize the intention in one. You intend, you intend for them to recognize that the first condition is true. But we add on this further condition, which is that you intend your audience to believe P, the thing that you mean, precisely because they recognize that you intended for them to believe P. Putting it slightly differently, you want your intention for them to believe something to be part of the reason or the evidence that they, that they rely on in forming their belief. And this will now cover the, the China breaking example. Because remember in the China breaking example, why does my wife believe that the China is broken? Well, she believes it's broken precisely because she sees it's broken. The fact that I also intend for her to believe that, and the further fact that she recognized that I intend that, don't really play any role in her belief formation there. Just seeing the china broken would be enough for her to come to believe that it's broken. But in that case, it's, clear, it's clearly not true that I intend for her to believe that the china is broken because I intend for it's clearly not the case that I intend for her to believe the China is broken because she recognizes that I intend for her to believe that. I just intend for her to believe it by seeing that the China is broken. So the crucial final missing element, Christ thinks, is that to not naturally mean something, it's not just the case that I have to intend to produce some sort of belief in the person, it's not just true that I have to intend for them to recognize that I intend for them to believe this. It's these, these intentions, or their recognitions of these intentions, have to be part of the reason why it would be a good idea for my audience to conclude P in the first place. That is a crucial part of what it takes to, to communicate something, according to Bryce. It's a crucial part of what it takes to, to mean something by saying something. You have to intend your audience to believe that thing because they recognize, precisely because they recognize that you intended them to do that. So like the Mark II account, Grice's account sort of accrues all the advantages of the accounts we've seen in between. It doesn't have a problem with either the tail code example or the, or the basketball player example, for the same reason the original intentional account didn't. It doesn't have a problem with the detective case, because the Mark II account didn't, and this is just the Mark II account with an extra clause. And finally, it doesn't have this thing which was supposed to be a problem for the Mark II account, the, the China breaking example. It doesn't have that problem because it has this extra final third condition. In the China breaking example, Grace thinks this third intention, you don't, you don't in fact have this third intention, and that's why it's not a case of non-natural meaning.